Welcome to the John Brown University Chapel podcast, recorded in the historic Cathedral of the Ozarks in Salem Springs, Arkansas. This chapel message is by Jim Caldwell, Professor of Construction Management at JBU. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, What a blessing to be here. It's a real honor. It was 100 years ago this coming Monday that classes started on our campus. So today it's fitting that we look at the window that depicts the year JVU was founded. To help our study this morning, I brought in several items from each section of the window. On this side, I have the objects representing the life of Christ. We have a carpenter's axe, a square, a wood saw, a piece of lumber, and a scroll representing the scriptures that Jesus studied and understood very well. On this side, we have the items that were selected to represent the first year of JVU's history. We have corn representing the farming that was done on our campus, a masonry trowel representing the mortar box, framing lumber, and the 1919 Articles of Incorporation of JVU, actually called Southwestern Collegiate Institute. Between July 23, 1919, when John Brown, the founder, proclaimed, I'll build that school, and September 29th, a 9,000 square foot building was constructed to start classes. In these two short months, funds were raised, plans were drawn up, with actual construction only taking 35 days. As the Christ Overall History Book tells us, there was a lot of hammering going on for many weeks after classes started to finish the project. There weren't even windows installed in the frames on the first day of class. The first campus buildings housed classrooms, offices, the chapel, the dining room, the kitchen, the men's and women's dormitory, And I laugh, and we thought the Walker Center was a new idea when we built that. In the original Articles of Incorporation, signed on August 6, 1919, the purpose of JBU was stated, to establish and maintain an industrial college wherein courses of instruction in the arts and sciences, including courses in industrial arts, home economics, agriculture, and the mechanical arts will be given. I also have a copy of the subsequent warranty deed to our nearly 300-acre campus that was filed less than eight months later. It reads as follows. Known all men by these presents that John E. Brown and Juanita Brown, his wife, for and in consideration of the sum of one dollar and agreements here and after set forth to be paid by John E. Brown College subject to the conditions here and after set forth the following described lands. The first thing of interest here is the amount of the sale. What a blessing that John Brown, the founder, gave his personal land to start our university. He was a great visionary that put it all on the line. The second thing to point out is that the grantor expressed his preferences while making this transaction. One of those desires expressed in the deed is as follows. It's the earnest purpose of the founder that John E. Brown College forever stand as a champion of the original laws of God and of the outstanding doctrines as found in the Word of God to use the Holy Bible as a textbook. And such acceptance pledges its teaching staff to teach this book as a book in which men spake from God as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It's encouraging to me that our JBU seven-point doctrinal statement implemented many years after this deed was filed is very consistent with this request in our campus deed. It's listed as number one in our doctrinal statement. We believe the Bible to be the inspired, the only infallible, authoritative word of God. This requirement in our deed is a good motivation for all of us faculty to teach each of our subjects in light of the word of God. Students, you can help us keep accountable to carry out this request from the founder. With this deed request in mind, let's look at the upper half of stained glass window number three. I think it's no coincidence that the symbols of the life of Christ are placed on top of the JBU history images in keeping with the motto we've had for 100 years, Christ over all. We're going to look at the life of Christ from age 12 in the temple, window two, to his baptism and beginning of his ministry years, window four. Our main reference will be Luke chapter 2, verse 51 and 52, the last two verses in the temple story. These verses set the stage for what some describe as the silent years of Jesus. 
Let us review what Dr. and Mrs. Beers spoke about last Tuesday regarding window number two and this story of young Jesus in the temple. His parents left him behind for several days in Jerusalem when they journeyed back to Nazareth. When I compare these events to modern times, I see a difference. We normally forget the youngest child. When I was picking up our four kids from church one time, I forgot our youngest and left her in the nursery. I got home and received a phone call. Do you mind coming back to church and picking up Deborah? Also, when my wife was about four years old, the youngest of five kids, her parents left her in a hotel room on family vacation. A few miles down the road, one of the older kids piped up, where's Barb? They quickly did a 180, retrieved her, and all was well. She's not been damaged, and I appreciate her being here today. Anyway, I think that if Jesus had been in Jerusalem many times before, and earlier in the chapter we read that he was filled with wisdom and God's grace, Mary and Joseph had a lot of trust in him and knew he was responsible. It's great to ponder how God the Father was working in the life of his son Jesus, expressing his deity even at a very young age. Both Joseph and Mary had encounters with angels prior to Jesus' birth. They were clearly told that their baby would be special. Joseph in Matthew 1, Emmanuel, God with us. And Mary in Luke 1, Son of God. Here, 12 years later, he tells his parents, I had to be in my father's house. I think it was God's plan that Mary and Joseph not fully understand the profound meaning of Jesus' statement that he was the Son of God at this point in his life. The Lord had ordained that Jesus spend the next 18 years in work and family, community relationships that would prepare him for his eventual public ministry. And I'm wondering if Joseph and Mary had fully understood his deity then, would they have turned him into a priest or a scholar instead of his natural role as a carpenter's helper? Maybe more likely it was that a practical need for his help in the daily farming duties and the business. When Jesus is finally reunited with his parents, we read the following. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them, but his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. We see the main lessons from the lost temple story. First, Jesus obeys and leaves with his parents. He doesn't want to stay any longer in the temple, even though I'm sure he had quite the audience. He was obedient to them and went home. Even though Mary and Joseph were godly parents who followed Jewish law and practice, they were not perfect, like any of your parents. Still, Jesus obeys them. We then have this short statement about Mary treasuring this event in her heart. I think her motherly instincts knew that the angel's promise prior to Jesus' birth was continuing to unfold. Next, we see that Jesus continues to grow in wisdom and stature. Somehow, the perfect Son of God grows in his relationship to his Father over 30 years. When he's baptized by John, we read that the Father says, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Jesus gained wisdom by faithfully doing his Father's work over these many, quote, silent years. Not only does he continue this favor with God his Father, but also with man. I believe the favor with man was largely helped by his work as a carpenter and his obedience to follow alongside his father, learning the trade. Being obedient to his earthly father would have yielded great reward in his standing in the community. God had ordained that Jesus grow up and spend 90% of his life in an obscure place called Nazareth. By most accounts, there were probably no more than two or 300 people in this farming community. This would have necessitated that even skilled tradesmen like Joseph and Jesus would have done basic farming duties along with their skilled work in construction. Nazareth didn't have a very good reputation at the time. It was a no-name place. This would, would have created stigma associated with Jesus as he moved about the region in his teens and his 20s. What seems even worse is that his own family in this small community didn't believe Jesus as he started his public ministry. In John 7, 3 to 5, Jesus' brothers said to him, You ought to go to Judea so that your disciples can see the miracles you do. For even his brothers did not believe him. Was it because they knew Jesus was really a half-brother that Joseph was not his real dad? 
Jesus obviously handled living with his family without sin, but I wonder if there was tension there growing up, brought on by his half-brothers, that gave him life experience to draw on in his future public teaching. Jesus relates this idea of family stress in Luke 21. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. Jesus' personal life experience gave him credibility to teach his disciples this truth. That is good news to many of you who may have strained relationships with your half-siblings. Jesus walked that same road that you were on. Some scholars think that as Jesus got older, he worked his trade in a much larger town nearby called Sephorus. It had wealthier clients uh, that could hire tradesmen, and with Sephorus only about three and a half miles from Nazareth, workers could make this commute in less than an hour and still return to their families and rural life in Nazareth. Jesus could have easily witnessed the troubles of riches for many years working in Sephorus which we later see revealed in his teaching. It would have also been a place where he could have engaged the government, pay taxes, and do other business affairs. Let's summarize what shaped Jesus' life prior to public ministry. First, obviously, his deity, his oneness with the Father in heaven, carrying on his Father's work. Second, his work, his family, his life experience. Jesus was fully human and key to his growing in favor with man was his many years of living life in the region of Galilee. Let's look now at the many accounts of Jesus in public ministry after age 30. By looking at his method of teaching, we can have a window into what his life was like prior to going public. Teaching in parables or storytelling was Jesus' preferred method of public ministry. We also know that the most compelling stories are ones that come from personal experience. When you look at the 46 parables that Jesus taught, They can be grouped into four broad categories. Number one is business, money, managing people in debt. Two is farming, animals, plants, and fishing. Number three is family relationships, weddings, friends, cooking, feasts, closings, etiquette, inheritance. And number four, institutions and privilege, legal systems, judges, taxes, temple prayer, hierarchy of kings, masters, servants, the poor in society. Jesus' teaching in these parables covers each of these four categories equally, about 25% in each, which I believe points to the well-rounded life he lived from ages 12 to 30. He learned this great breadth of life from many, his parents, his friends, and his personal experience as an adult. I believe that he gained a lot of these experiences through his work, his job as a carpenter, or as many believe, a general builder. Most buildings back then were made of stone and masonry, So Jesus could have likely been involved in much more than just woodworking. Imagine the many clients he may have had in all sectors of society. The bookkeeping of this business would have led him to a wealth of experience in handling money and debt and people. Running this construction business would have required that he engage the institutions of the day, tax collectors, legal systems. There could have been helpers or hired laborers, again, giving great firsthand experience in dealing with people. It's easy to imagine that some of these people needing a job were poor. In summary, the long list of these 46 parables that Jesus taught came from his personal life experience. Certainly he taught from his authority as God in human flesh, but having experienced the things in each of these parables would give him credibility with his audiences and a model for us to share our personal stories as we pass down our heritage of faith to each generation that follows. Let's examine the correlation between the preparation years of Jesus with the preparation years of our founder prior to starting JBU. Our founder also had a wide range of experiences prior to 1919 that shaped his vision. And the Lord used each one of those to fulfill his purposes here. As Dr. Pollard shared when describing window number one, founder John Brown Sr. was born and raised in Iowa. Those early years on the farm taught him valuable lessons especially the virtues of hard work and discipline. From age 11 on, he was working outside the home as well as having a variety of experiences in church and community. He sang in the church choir, played instruments, worked in a livery stable, managing horses. 
These would be certainly valuable experiences in developing JBU's band and farming operations. One of the more influential jobs he had in Iowa was at a printing shop. The print media was critical in establishing curriculum and evangelistic material in the early part of the university. Let's look at another desire the founder described in the warranty deed. This conveyance is made for the following purposes, that the lands herein conveyed to said Johnny Brown College are conveyed to said college for the specific purpose of founding an institution of learning where worthy and ambitious young men and women may be helped to help themselves, and where throughout the years to come, the college shall stand as a school of industry where every student learns a trade. For you current students, do you feel worthy and ambitious? Many people have found you worthy to encourage you and to support you financially to attend JBU. A good response for this extraordinary privilege is to be ambitious. That way the professors here can help you help yourself. Also, what modern-day trade are you preparing for? We've certainly moved away from the early years of sewing and farming and mechanics but essential to your education here at JBU is a preparation for work. In the book, JBU, its founder and its founding, the author, Earl R. Williams, states that John Brown Sr. came to the conclusion that, quote, the only type of higher education worthy of time and expense involved would be one that would include God, would teach the dignity of productive work, and would include justifiable academic curriculum. This reinforced Brown's ideal of the threefold head, heart, and hand education. Don't let the fact that many of you will change careers several times in your life to discourage you from career preparation. Getting ready for your first job at a college is a great way to prepare for a lifetime of work and service. As we've seen from the life of Christ, the Lord will use the years of your work to prepare you for a wide range of ministry and service. As we read in Luke how Christ grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, Christ was obedient to his earthly father, to his heavenly father. Students, obey and honor your parents and work hard. Abide with Christ as you spend your four years here at JVU. Serve others so that you can grow in favor with the world around you. Maybe the Lord is calling you to an obscure place to live out your faith daily getting up and going to work, as Jesus did for many years, with no fanfare. A few years ago, a good friend of mine described his life with Christ, similar to being in a sailboat, clipping along with the wind and the sails and refreshing water all around. When I shared that with Barb, we decided that for us, working through life was more like being in a john boat, rowing through the calm and rough waters alike. I'm so glad to have been on this journey with my wife for 40 years, each of us having an oar. And if you know anything about rowing a boat, you have to be working in unison to get where you want to go because you can't even see where you're going, what's ahead. And if you aren't rowing together, you'll go in circles, or worse, you'll quit. We thank the Lord for giving us the grace to stay the course. There was a JVU student about 10 years ago sitting in this chapel like you who graduated and took a job with one of the largest contractors in the United States. He spent long days, month after month, performing his job with integrity and skill. One day, a 60-year-old superintendent came into his job trailer and shared, my third marriage is falling apart, I'm an alcoholic, and I'm at the end of my rope. I've seen that you have something different in your life. There was the open door to share about the hope in Christ. That is why that young man came to study at JVU. My hope is that is why you're here at JVU. We tend to study and look intently at the two or three years of Jesus' public ministry as a role model for living. We have extraordinary detail in the New Testament on how we should live and follow Christ but it may be just as important that for us to consider the many silent years of Jesus as our example to follow. I challenge you to think about this. Those really weren't silent years after all. We just don't have a record of Jesus' activity. He was very likely in the public arena, very much engaging people, 
working, serving, his family and community. Jesus very much was doing ministry prior to age 30, using an honorable profession that served many people with little fanfare. Window 3 is more than about tools and building materials you see on this stage, or even the cornfield that the founder gave to the start this university. It's about how God can use many years of working career to quietly minister to other people. 100 years ago this coming weekend, John Brown Sr. stated in the dedication of the first campus building, this is not my work. God has achieved this. It's fitting that I should end with a demonstration of one of these tools depicted in stained glass window number three. Dr. Pollard gave a great rendition of playing the drum a couple weeks ago. I will follow his lead and offer this song to you. Thank you. Let me leave you with these three points. Number one, be obedient to imperfect people. Honor your parents, your RA, your professors, your pastors. Number two, use your trade for serving others. Be willing to go if God calls you to a lifetime of obscure service in a no-name place. And three, finally, as John Brown, the founder, often said, trust God and go to work. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the John Brown University Chapel Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or whatever platform you're listening on, and we'd love it if you would leave us a review.